Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, an oral history podcast about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners. Loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this podcast and just tell me what they do all day and let me record how this affects us. Thank you for listening. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I don't think I still know what I want to be when I grew up. Mm. (laughs) Um, I really had no plans. I remember saying lots of different things. So Mm. anything from... Uh, an actress, singer, novelist. <laughs> um, I think once I said architect because that's what my dad did, but mm. I never had any talent in that direction, <laughs> but I knew it was a job. Um, I guess as I got slightly older, I was thinking more along the lines of things like vet or lawyer, mm. um, and then maybe in conservation, that sort of thing. And I mm-hmm. and I guess that may have been the, the sort of start of the route I, I subsequently went down. But I I mean, I don't know. Uh, I certainly wasn't one of these children that had something very strong in mind. And then I, I followed that, that through at all. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So no, you didn't want to be a princess or a vet or an astronaut or a... I don't remember princess. <laughs> <laughs> Not not sure astronaut. Vet I certainly considered, though not not medical doctor. I was very clear about that. <laughs> so I think I, I guess I always had quite an affinity with animals. Mm. Um I did think about uh teaching, certainly, which is obviously an element of, of my job now, but not really, you know, I'd I'd thought about it in a um a more sort of secondary school type scenario. And I think mm. it's really it's really difficult as you're growing up because you're not exposed to that many jobs you don't yeah. really know what's out there and and so yeah I do have a lot of sympathy with our students when we're asking them the same thing essentially yeah um you know e- even even at uh, sort of 17 where they're having to make the decision I remember being at that age and sort of weighing up between at that point history and biology I was always pretty um good academically all all round Mm -hmm. um and so it wasn't that there was an obvious thing that I was particularly good at Mm -hmm. um I was I was interested in in history and and sort of archaeology and that kind of route Mm -hmm. um but I was also interested in zoology and and biology more generally and Mm -hmm. I guess it was um, well no I, I I do think it came down to in the end I wanted to do something that I was really interested in Mm. Um, but I also wanted a career and some stability in, in mm. that career. And I I think I felt at that time that that biology offered that more so than history. I'm still not sure <laughs> how, <laughs> how accurate I think I think that is. I guess there there are quite a lot of biology related jobs that mm. that you could go into outside academia. Mm. I didn't I didn't consider academia itself I didn't yeah. know anybody who um in fact I can't really think that I knew anybody who went to university mm. so uh, as I mentioned my dad was an architect but um he this was in the in the 1930s 40s I guess right um and he put himself through night school and polytechnic mm. um and he went that route so it wasn't sort of standard university kind of route yeah and um, my mum left school at 16 without any qualifications at all and mm. my the rest you know my brothers and sisters didn't go to university either so it wasn't really something I 
I thought I probably wanted to go to university and do a yeah. degree. I didn't know that that there were options then beyond that at university, yeah. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is quite it's quite an unusual route that I've gone down and not one that my family really had a lot of understanding of. Um mm. so yeah, quite quite different from from the sorts of things that they do. So yeah, I guess I'm the odd odd one out. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to series four, episode fourteen, and to my guest, Dr. Amanda Bretman. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the twenty eighth of February twenty twenty three. I love doing this. Where else could I have a serious conversation about fruit flies? Dr. Amanda Bretman is Associate Professor in Behavioural Ecology in the Faculty of Biological Sciences at the University of Leeds. After completing her PhD in Leeds in 2004, she undertook postdoctoral research at the Cornwall campus of the University of Exeter and at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, returning to Leeds in 2013 to take up her first independent academic position. Dr. Bretman's research and teaching is in the field of animal behaviour. Using insects as models, she addresses questions such as how social cues alter reproductive strategies and ageing patterns, and how climate change will affect fertility. In 2021, she became the University Dean of Research Quality, with a wide remit to support and enable the production of the highest quality research at Leeds. Dr. Bretman expresses only her own views in this interview and not those of the university. Right, let's do this. Episode 94 of Working Hours with Dr. Amanda Bretman. I think it's interesting there that you mentioned teaching and, uh, you know, I've had a few teachers on and a lot of people think of teacher and people sort of, you know, who are doing other things have mentioned teaching. And I think you're right. It's, you know, it's about exposure to roles and different kinds of jobs like you can only know about a job if you know about a job um yeah and like you say even with academia until you go there you don't think of necessarily obviously you're aware people work there but you don't think of it as a job because it's it you know you you don't know anyone that does that job right exactly exactly and teachers are you know they're they're such a big part of your life as as a child Mm. so Mm. I think that's that was also I think for me, I always wanted to do something that, um, you know, I was never motivated by money. I was Mm. motivated by making some sort of a difference, but I didn't really know what what that was. Mm. Um, So I I guess that may have kind of taken me down that that route of, you know, teaching and and now now research. So what is it that you're doing now? Well, currently I'm uh, an associate professor in behavioural ecology um, Mm. in the School of Biology. So um, it's um, the sort of university role that combines research and teaching. Mm. Not all university lecturers do do both, but um, yeah, my current role co- combines the two of them. Um, and I've also uh, fairly recently taken on a, a university level leadership role as well. Mm-hmm. So that's the Dean of Research Quality. So, um, yeah, my my job can be quite, quite varied. Obviously, there are different aspects to all of those three elements. Mm-hmm. Um, I teach um, in the well, mainly in the field of animal behaviour, but that also brings in other sorts of, um, you know, we're, t- we're trying to teach people how to be biologists, essentially, and how to think critically about evidence um, across all aspects of biology. So there are, there are lots of different skills that I would also teach within that, not just about animal behaviour kind of content and, and evolution and, and that mm. sort of thing. Mm. Um, so in terms of teaching, you know, I, I would devise the curriculum I actually do the teaching whether that's in sort of um, formal lecturing in seminars in small groups Mm. um, in labs and um, then also devise the assessment and and do the marking which is something that's (laughs) it's it's not a massively fun time I'm sure the students don't have a a massive amount of fun doing the the assessments but yeah (laughs) we all just have to get through it (laughs) yeah um, and also we provide um, sort of aspects of, of broader support beyond the, the sorts of subject teaching that we're doing. So mm-hmm. obviously, I said, we're trying to develop skills, but also um, sort of career advice and also personal um, support as well. Mm. 
then within research well I don't I don't get to do hands-on research anymore I Mm. don't have (laughs) the time for that so I'm not going into a lab and doing experiments anymore which uh, some days I I do miss that because that's that's a massive part of the training to be this type of university lecturer you essentially have to go through a a period of training that is all about the research Mm. um and not so much about the teaching um but the how how I do research now is that I run a, a small team of people who are PhD students or mm-hmm. postdoctoral researchers, and I will be sort of leading the projects, um, having some of the initial ideas certainly, and then it becomes more of a collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, training people in in how to think scientifically about um, going about their their experiments. Um, and helping them with sort of all aspects of then doing the research and then communicating the the research. Mm. And we work in, so I, as I said, I, I've got a team here in Leeds, but um, I collaborate with um, people at um, UEA in Norwich, in mm. Liverpool, mm. in Sweden and Germany. So we have sort of a, a slightly broader team um, mm. network as well. Um, and so do, doing the research is is one aspect of that uh, communicating is is really important so writing papers um doing talks at conferences doing talks yeah. for the public as well that that sort of thing um also there's a lot of assessment of other people's work that has to be done so every paper that's published um goes through a process of peer review so it's sent out to other experts in the field and they they give their opinion and hopefully try to try to improve it Mm. um and so you know if i if i'm sending papers out i also have to do some of that work as well for the community so that that's uh, something i spend a lot of time doing also um writing grant applications so for most of the research that that i would be doing i need to employ people i need to have funding for um all the consumable sort of things that we use or and so um yeah a, quite a lot of my time is spent trying yeah, to persuade money. people to spend money on that yeah. um and again likewise um being part of the community that then decides on other people's research and and Mm. recommendations for funding as well is that Um, a mix of public and private or is or does that depend on the project or is it always mixed or how how does that break down really depends on on the type of research Um, and most of my research um doesn't have direct sort of industrial application for example Mm. and so most of my funding comes from um either um basically public funding so um we have um a big public funder called ukri and they will fund lots of different aspects of, of research um and so that's mainly where i get my funding from Mm -hmm. also some charities are are interested in the kind of research that we do so like Like um welcome trust or something like that yeah yeah exactly welcome trust lever hume trust is also a a really big one for my my area um other other people do get um industrial funding um Mm -hmm. or and and using an industry in quite a wide sense there because Mm -hmm. you know um that that can be to do with producing a product but it Mm. can be to do with producing a policy for example and Mm. so there there might be different types of funders for different types of research but Mm. yeah mostly my my research comes through um that sort of public government funding route Mm. Mm. um so uh, uh I want to ask a slightly stupid question here before we proceed. So I want to ask what is biology, but I mean, at a university level, because obviously, you know, there'll be pe- there will be people who listen to this sort of thing and it's kind of like, well, it's biology, it's fairly sort of straightforward, but obviously it, it fragments, you know, it's that like, that's a big overarching, that's the macro, isn't it, biology, but then you've got like the breaking down into all these different specialisms within biology that branch off and off. So what are you teaching are you kind of giving a foundation for all of these things where people go into specialisms or is it is it its own specialism like how does that yeah so what is biology for you for for your purposes yeah no i mean it it is a a sort of huge field mm. <laughs> you're you're absolutely right there so i mean you could biology is essentially um the science of of living things and so mm. that that can have many aspects to it um 
in Leeds, we have um, lots of different specialisms. Uh, we don't cover the whole of biology, of course, mm. but but uh, we have um, our first degrees are, are really quite foundational. So mm. we we teach a general biology course. That's mm. one of our, our biggest. And so we have to think about the full range from um, really from the sort of molecular cells and genes level right up to how um, uh, ecosystems work together mm -hmm. and so we have people who who work in all of those sorts of areas and actually my specialism and, and my research also incorporates um, an understanding of how um, animals respond to their environment for mm -hmm. example and that can be very much in terms of measuring their behavior mm -hmm. I spent a long time also measuring things like reproductive output because mm -hmm. um, that's obviously really really important for for mm -hmm. animals to be able to reproduce and to understand the kind of underlying mechanisms I've done um, I use genetic tools um, to understand those as well so it it, it it's really quite interdisciplinary mm -hmm. and um i think this this is really why we we have to work as teams mm -hmm. you know no one no one person could really have the specialism to be able to do all of all of that together and so mm -hmm. it's, i think it's really important that we work collaboratively i think um that really helps us to move forward more more quickly mm -hmm. I mean, you get, so I'm thinking of, you know, basic workplace dynamics of, um, you know, working in silos and working in sort of separate groups and teams and stuff, and they don't always communicate. Like, uh, with specialists, I, I'm, I imagine there's levels of having to learn to communicate with someone because they're like a real expert in something, like really drilled down into and just know so much about one thing that you couldn't possibly do unless you were just doing that but then there's be gaps between you of do you know what i mean i think there'd be information gaps so is that quite easy to navigate or is that <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> it really it, it's it's quite difficult every sort of specialism has its own language in in a way mm. and how how it sort of um talks about different issues um all the jargon that that they use and so you know even when i'm talking to a different type of biologist so for example maybe a, a computational biologist mm. versus me who who works you know with with insects behavior mm. Mm. um that that can even be quite difficult let alone trying to be the sort of ha have the kind of interdisciplinary projects that sort of span you know out into social sciences or mm. um physics <laughs> mm. so mm. so yeah i think it, it it can be really enriching and rewarding but but it does add a, a, an extra layer of of sort of difficulty to it and i think it's also something that's more difficult for other people to understand and understand whether or not the that research is really high quality because again when they're when they're doing their sort of review process they are probably an expert in one aspect of that work mm. and not in the other mm -hmm. and so whilst I think th there's certainly been a, a push over the last well even certainly decade perhaps even longer than that to become more interdisciplinary yeah, yeah. um it's not always the easiest thing to do and it, and it's mm. sometimes not always the the right answer but i think having a having a sort of forum where we can do mm. that kind of work mm. i think is is really great and that's you know one, one of the really brilliant things about Leeds University is it is so big and broad mm. that there's such breadth and depth of expertise that mm. we can do do those kinds of projects. But yes, you, no, you're you're absolutely right about the communication. Mm. I mean, it's um, well, I, I'm thinking there, there must be loads of great things to it in terms of there's always something to learn, and if you're actively interested in it and you're still sort of interested in the learning, you can keep that. Um, yeah, there's always more to discover and like is the frustration so 
let's go what are the good good and what are the good bits of the job the bits that really kind of excite you or the bits that kind of brought you into the role and kind of kept you in the role yeah I think that's you know what you've just mentioned is is sort of a sort of a double-edged double-edged sword Mm. in in a way because it is the you know I think what what drives any researcher is the desire to know to mm. be able to explore something new mm. um that brings with it its own um sort of pressures as well thinking about mm. well is is this idea that i have is it really novel is mm. it really feasible how am mm. i actually going to approach this mm. i think it's got kind of the the mix of creativity and structure that that just sort of works well with my personality but but again that's kind of um those two things don't always work well together Mm. and and can can be quite tough and there's um you know that there are some real high points so you um produce a paper you have a phd student graduate you Mm. get a new grant and that there's some real excitement there that you're going to be able to do something new Mm -hmm. um and there are some real low points. There mm. are some real, it's it's a lot of rejection and that is mm. tough mm. because there's, there's simply more good ideas than can possibly be funded. Mm. Mm. <laughs> to produce a paper takes months and months and months. And sometimes there are whole, you know, rounds and rounds of people not arguing necessarily, but sort of having different opinions that you have to try and incorporate. Mm. Um and sometimes you just don't end up with the, you know, you, you can start a, a project thinking it's going to go one way. Mm. And one of the wonderful things is it doesn't, it, you know, it surprises you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if we always knew what the outcome was going to be at the start of the project, there would be no point doing it. Really. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, you know, it's uh, it's testing a hypothesis, isn't it? It's, it's like we've, we've got this research we want to see, but you you're trying to, answer a question but also ask a question and see what questions get turned up as well right and they questions always get turned up yeah I've, I've never got <laughs> what's to the, the answer to this question more questions <laughs> right exactly exactly and so it just it's really sort of snowballs and, and part of the skill is then deciding well what am I going to follow up what's mm. what's the the best way to go from here there mm. are so many things we could do mm. what what's what's really going to sort of be impactful on on ideas that are that are already out there mm. um and so yeah i think there there are so many aspects to the job that are exactly like that on, on the on the one hand it it is the brilliant thing about it and on the other mm. it's the thing that you know keeps me awake at night <laughs> <laughs> um, and and i think it does put quite a lot of stress on academics to mm. to think that they need to be constantly producing at, at mm. the highest possible level and you know everybody's career I think goes through kind of some peaks and troughs and mm. that, those could be really hard to just kind of push through mm. it can feel really personal because it mm. it kind of is mm. you know they're your ideas you thought you <laughs> you wrote a brilliant grant and mm. then people have turned around and said well no that's not it's not very interesting it's not interesting enough for us to to fund and and that can be really hard to hard to take um mm. and mm. take you know some some time to get over and get back on the horse especially if it's one you really if you're really passionate about one particular one and then it's like oh no that so should have got funded no that that's exactly it and then you get you sort of you know you you try not to waste ideas you go back to Mm. it and you think okay well what what aspects of that maybe didn't work so well Mm. didn't really capture the imagination or you know could we get some more data to know that actually this is going to be feasible and um reduce the risks but um you know so I've, i had a had a meeting with a, a couple of uh collaborators yesterday looking at a grant that we had failed to get a couple of years ago and just going this is a really good grant we really want to do this what mm. what are we going to change in order mm. to to try again um would it be a matter of hitting trying to hit a different funder or you know, could you could just keep reapplying with the same thing to try and find the money? Um, it it depends on the funder rules as to whether or not you right. can yeah, kind yeah. of go again. I guess 
part of the it, it depends why it was rejected yeah um you know if you, if you look at some of the comments from from the reviewers and and sometimes they they have some really you know they've, they've pointed some things out that you yeah, yeah. really need to take on board yeah um and sometimes you can get lost in things as well can't you absolutely and i think that's that's part of the reason that for all the um all the downsides of, of the peer review process and having having to go out to other people who are completely you know unrelated to the project and get their mm. opinion on it, mm. it that it it can it can be tough and it can you know put a lot of again a lot of workload onto the community mm. but i think ultimately it does help us get towards the really great science whilst it it can feel really tough i think eventually it it does help mm. but it, it can be um as i said it can it can feel really personal even when it's it, you know it's, it's not really a personal attack at all mm. um but you know you spend months and months preparing something mm. to to have it kind of not knocked down <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah yeah and at the end of the day it's it, it's that sort of you know, it's that presentation. Well, it's it's that show moment, isn't it? It's like, has this show succeeded or not? You know, you're building up, you're building up, and then you put on the show, and then it's like, oh, did it work? Did they right. like it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you put something out there, and it can, you know, you 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 think you've had a great idea, and maybe you get it published some um, somewhere that you think, oh, this is really going to take off, and then it doesn't, and then you have to yeah. think, well, why why what <laughs> <laughs> what was missing from that or is it just that you know sometimes it can take a while for ideas to get traction within yeah. the the community and and so it's it's difficult to tell when something's not picking up sort of with other people whether it's because it's just it just isn't something that other people are interested in or it's just taking a bit of time mm. to to get people interested and and I think so one aspect of of my work is to understand how animals use social cues to alter their reproductive strategies and it also mm -hmm. alters things like their aging profiles and their cognitive ability so mm. how how good they are at learning and, and memory mm. and I use fruit flies which mm. are um, have been a hugely important model across biology, across medicine, across genetics. Mm -hmm. I think there are six Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for work on fruit flies because mm. they're just such a, a, a brilliant, useful model for us. Mm. And yet people seem to find it difficult that, that they – the flies interact together and they take any kind of notice of of their social environment yeah because they're so they they appear so different to us well and, and they're yeah. so small <laughs> right, like how, exactly. how much can they think you know <laughs> and yet <laughs> again massive model in neuroscience yeah. so um but yeah i i i think there are i think that aspect has I've come up with a little, come across a little bit of resistance to mm. the idea that they are useful. They can tell us about what the impacts of a stressful social environment are, mm. or social isolation, and and the the effects of that, and the mechanisms that underlie that. Um, and so, you know, you you can have within a particular community. So my work. I started that work thinking mm. about reproductive strategies. So how males understand that there are other male flies around and mm. that they're going to be in competition and then what they do about that. Okay. Um, and what's the, what's the sort of optimum strategy they can take to get the most offspring. Okay. And because they've been, I guess, used in that sort of way for a long time, I don't think that was particularly controversial <laughs> at all. And I think, you know that that was kind of really um th those papers were sort of accepted by by the sorts of people that i was already within that community mm -hmm. and more recently i've been thinking about what are the other effects of having that social contact mm -hmm. so the reproductive strategies are, are one thing but as i said um we then started thinking about what what are the other implications of of that environment for them so we we've, we've looked at their how their gene expression changes when they're faced with another male how their ability to learn 
changes, how they um, age differently, and also how their microbiome changes. So this is the community of bacteria that, you know, we have mm. a microbiome in our gut. It has mm. really important effects for us. Flies have, have the same, mm. and it's affected by their social environment. Mm. And I think it's just um, a, a little bit... Um, uh slightly out there <laughs> for some people to think that that really flies are are really paying that much attention and really they're just sort of kind of flying around everywhere and don't really care that there are other flies around <laughs> they don't even know they're flying okay well, <laughs> before we go further let's right let's go back so why are fruit flies so good as a as a to use so what what what's the what's the basis my like I know there you can go through lots so you can go through the entire life cycle and I would imagine they're reasonably easy to reproduce so um yeah so but why uh what are the the big reasons so I mean the, those kind of are the start of the big reasons so mm. you know you, you can the the way to get really robust evidence is to be able to have um, information from lots of individuals so mm. You can do that with with flies pretty um, cheaply in a small space. You can, um, as as you said, you can go through their whole life cycle quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, they reproduce really fast. So if you're trying to understand evolution across generations, mm -hmm. well, that's really difficult to do in humans. <laughs> but mm -hmm. with fruit flies, you you can go through say twelve generations in a year. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty rapid um but they started to be used um at the er in the early 20th century as a genetic model because we're all quite highly similar genetically to a, to a degree kind of thing but it's a really like high correspondence isn't it with a fruit fly which well, you wouldn't think of right they are reasonably different but there are enough similarities that they can <laughs> yeah. you know we can we can find similar genes in yeah. humans and flies yeah. and i think it's about 75 percent of the health disorders in humans that have a genetic basis mm. have a, a gene that that is similar in flies so you know that's that's huge <laughs> who would who would have ever thought that <laughs> right right and and i guess they first started to be used as a much simpler model to try to understand the the cellular mechanisms that yeah. that underpin genetics mm -hmm. but then beca because lots of people started using them because of that mm -hmm. you've got this whole proliferation of understanding and mm -hmm. lots of different techniques so they're really um easy to manipulate mm -hmm. in terms of both i mean you can do environmental manipulations with them really really easily so you can change things about their food for example very very easily mm. but you can also interfere with their genes really easily mm. or rel relatively easily compared mm. to other other animals they're also um thinking about you know the ethics of of doing this sort of research mm. obviously we don't really want to be doing that sort of thing leave um, the flies alone they've done in, nothing to you <laughs> <laughs> you know they they are um a lab model that are seen as much better than you know mice in in terms of doing yeah, yeah. that kind of big um and really invasive i suppose it, it mm. experiment um mm. And uh, yeah, maybe the maybe we'll change our mind about that as we learn more and more about, you know, what the flies are experiencing. But yeah. for now, that yeah. that is that is the case. And so, um, be, because of this ability to ma manipulate, so I can literally, um, you know, look at other studies that people have done, mm. think, oh, this gene might be important in this behaviour that that I'm looking at. And then order um, a, a line of flies that are that have that gene manipulated, and I can understand the functional significance of that of that gene. So mm. that that is incredibly useful. So how many flies would you order at a time? <laughs> I mean, so they they basically come in little tubes <laughs> about okay. the size about the size of a finger. Okay. But yeah. they, so you're not yeah. getting a hundred weight of fruit flies or anything. I suppose I, you'd run it, they'd all die before you could do anything useful uh, with them. Well yeah and, and you you know you just then 
start reproducing those you don't you don't need mm. that many to start <laughs> to start with um so yeah that that's also why it's fabulously useful and and they're just you know globally they're used in labs around the world mm. so um i i suppose as, given how long they've been used and and how many labs do use them it's mm. it's amazing that we've still got so much to learn from them mm. um uh, but i really think we're just scratching the surface honestly it's it's incredible isn't it really like the the fact that there's even the perception out there that it's like oh well we know everything it's like no I, I saw this thing a while back and it was on I, I mean I talked to a glaciologist last year oh. but like I saw this thing on icebergs uh I think it was on BBC but they were like oh we don't know anything about icebergs it's like how well what is there to know and also how do we not know anything about icebergs <laughs> It's like, well, no one's studied them really. So, and then it's like, turns out if you study this thing, there's loads of really interesting things about it, and loads of stuff that you can learn and apply elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, uh, the the second part of the fruit fly conversation, what's the fruit fly like? You know, what's courtly love like then in fruit fly world? What's what's the town <laughs> square like? What what are they up to? What's going on? Um. So the yes the the male has a, a courtship ritual, mm. so he will um, follow the female about, mm. and um, he will try to get her attention by tapping her, mm. and um, so he, he he follows behind, and then he tries to get around in front of Is her. Is this all in the air? No, you no, usually okay. they're they're sort it's of when they land, they they're on on a surface and right. they're they're sort of following each other around um and then he will sing to her um which we can't hear with our you know with our hearing but you can see them singing because they they stick one wing out and it vibrates really fast and that's that's him singing um and so yeah which has effects on uh on the female in terms of her gene expression Mm. amazingly Mm. you can you can give the female the song of a different species of of fruit fly and it has a different effect on her behavior and then her the expression of her immune genes Mm. which i just find utterly remarkable anyway once once the singing is out of the way um if she accepts that that this is something that she wants to do and she doesn't need to accept she can Mm. walk off sometimes she'll she'll kick the male in the face when he tries to (laughs) to mount (laughs) um but if she accepts, she sort of opens opens her wings a little bit, and and he can uh, attach properly. And then for the species that I mainly use, about fifteen to twenty minutes later, they they separate. She'll lay eggs. He'll probably go off and see if he can find another female. Um, and the um, one one of the amazing things that we've learned from the fruit flies is that. When they mate, the male isn't just passing sperm to the female. Mm. He's passing a a cocktail of um, proteins as well that have effects on the female behavior, um, like they increase her egg laying rate. Mm. They reduce her willingness to remate with another male. Mm -hmm. Um, They change her sleep patterns. They Mm -hmm. change her immune responses. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they kill her faster as well. Mm. so um, a really interesting set of proteins and some really mm. uh interesting interactions there between mm. between the male and, and the female mm. so yeah i've watched an awful lot of fly matings and uh <laughs> <laughs> my lab would joke that i can basically you know spot a mating from <laughs> three meters away around a corner <laughs> um okay so just uh, another clarification question what is gene expression so we we all have uh, the genes within our cells that are going to make all of the proteins that we use for all of the activity that we that we do, but they're not all switched on at the same time. Mm. And so by looking at when these genes are switched on and switched off, we can understand what the cell is doing or what the tissue is doing at any any particular time. Mm. And so if we see an effect for example like the switching on of immune genes that might mean that the the body is preparing for an attack from um a bacteria or some, something like that mm-hmm. um so that's that's 
what we mean by that and and it kind of indicates um you know if you if you see that a gene on is on at a particular time that might imply that it's important in whatever is happening to mm-hmm. that animal or organism because you know mm. we're genes <laughs> all organisms but um at that at that particular time mm. so um it, it's it's uh, a technique that's really widely used across biology now to understand um what what's turned on and off at, mm. at, at different times and what's controlling that that process mm. because obviously if it goes wrong then that can have quite serious consequences for the the organism as well mm. yeah no more homeostasis for you right <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um right so but uh, i could probably go into more hours of, of fly talk but i'm gonna press so could i <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the thing <laughs> so um right so how did you get into it we've touched on some of this but was it a straight route of once you got into university you were kind of like oh this is interesting and you know you had someone that that was teaching you that was really good that inspired you and you you went off or you found a book or and then you just stayed or did you do a few things and go around a bit or like how did it happen um I I suppose it turned out to be quite a straight um route um but yeah so I started my um first degree which was a a general biology degree in York um really quite quickly it felt like the right fit for me Mm -hmm. um you know it, it wasn't that all of the aspects of biology were were immediately interesting to me but certainly enough were and and also the um when we were able to do experiments and we could design things for ourselves that that really sort of captured my imagination um i then um you know did did pretty well and so thought yeah let's let's carry on and did a masters by research again at york mm-hmm. um and i by that point had decided that I wanted to do a PhD but again I didn't really know what that meant I just mm-hmm. knew it knew it was a an option um so I looked around for people who were doing things that I found interesting and mm-hmm. um there was someone at Leeds um Tom Tregenza was my PhD supervisor he worked on um he used crickets rather than flies mm-hmm. but again the the aspects of um mating behavior that are really important for um like in individuals in terms of how many offspring that they have for example mm-hmm. um and so i approached him and and he put me into a, a competition to get funding and mm-hmm. um luckily won that i it, it wasn't the only um place i applied to it was the only one that offered <laughs> offered me the yeah. position so you know that that decided um, that question that but... did did make <laughs> things a lot easier <laughs> so then I started my my PhD so a PhD is really a um training mm. in in research mm. um and you know aims to have an independent researcher at, at the end who can again think about what a good question is and then how to approach that and, and to do actually do the research to answer that question mm. um but it does it does take a lot of training and it's really that relationship with the supervisor is really important mm-hmm. because they you know they are the mentor and mm. and they um really guide you in in how to do that and mm. and yeah we we had a a really good relationship though i will say um i nearly quit the number of times. a lot of people do a lot of people do yeah. don't they so you know it, i yeah. mean it's an achievement in itself to finish no it, it, it I mean, it's an achievement to get started <laughs> and then it's an, another achievement to get finished no uh, it 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 definitely is and um you know that there were things that weren't gelling properly there were there were mm. some difficulties but you know I, I wrote it out because ultimately I was always interested mm. I always just wanted to know mm. and that just kept me motivated enough to get through those mm. those tough times and that's you know that that's something that I talk to my PhD students about mm. now you know mm. how how that that can hit you 
through during the PhD mm. and and how to how to get over that. But yeah, so then I decided um, towards the end of that that I did want to carry on. Maybe it's because I didn't uh, again have my, very much imagination in terms of what else I could do. <laughs> um, but uh, I I just knew that I wasn't finished. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, still. Yeah. I still wanted to know. So um, whilst uh, uh, I got offered a job in Sheffield, but then there was this opportunity. Um, the University of Exeter made a new campus in Cornwall. I think that was 2004, five, mm-hmm. just at, as I was finishing my um, PhD. And uh, my boss got offered a job down there. And mm-hmm. then he offered me a job to go, go down, set up a lab, which was kind of a new kind of aspect I'd always just been able to walk into a, mm. a a lab that's already set up and just do my experiments so this was I guess a, a different aspect to being able to manage research mm. to do that and I was also able to again follow some questions that I was really interested in mm-hmm. um so I spent a couple of years there then I spent um I had to get another job <laughs> and mm. went to the University of East Anglia for mm. 18 months came back to Cornwall for 18 months mm. uh went back to East Anglia <laughs> for three mm. years so it's it's quite um that initial phase is reasonably precarious in a way I was way. gonna say are they all yeah. like full-time permanent positions or are they temporary you know like a year funded or is it just yeah. based on whatever they've got the funding for for it, however long exactly exactly yeah. so um it it's it's a full time job, but but and you have to teach as well, don't you? Um, not not, not when, always. Not usually very right. much as a as a postdoctoral researcher in in um a sort of biological sciences. You're you're almost contracted to do a piece of work that that your boss has mm. you know applied for and got the money to mm-hmm. for, and yeah, unfortunately, um, you know they are limited term contracts and that's mm. something that is quite uh, it's, it, it it's a problem in the, in the job i mean it, it, in some ways you know it was good to be able to switch between labs get different experience mm. um get a different viewpoint on on things cuz you know staying staying in the same lab mm. can get a, a bit samey i suppose mm. but um on the other hand it it's kind of nice to have a bit of security and be able yeah. to, you know, have put down some roots and and plan. Yeah. And and it makes um, access to credit and things like that more difficult. So it, yeah, it, yeah, it absolutely does. Um yeah. getting a mortgage, for example, exactly. problematic. Yeah. And that is one of the things that we're trying to address at the university. And I think more widely across academia is, you know, that's <laughs> that is problematic. But on the other hand, we've also got a scenario where we're employing people that are specialists in in what they do Mm. and we employ them to do a particular piece of work that requires that specialism. Yeah, you don't necessarily need them to hang around forever. It's kind of like, we need you to answer this or to do this or to teach this, but then things change or they might only have the money for them for so long and so on. Yeah, and and it's it's a problem. So, I mean, we're we're trying to think of ways... uh, that that we could sort of smooth between those contracts mm. um and it's it's really difficult so you know the the university has been trying to move away from short term contracts but the group of people that are most difficult to to do that for are the postdoctoral researchers mm. because you know you get you get funding for 18 months 2 years 3 years mm. is is most often I, w- I would say the kind of length of, of funding that you would get mm. and then you know you always try to get more funding but that is you know very much up in the air you may or may not mm. get that yeah, yeah, and yeah. so what happens to that person at the end of that funding now at some point they will want to move on to their own independent um uh, set up their own group which mm-hmm. is is then what what I did after that period of what seven years where I was switching between Cornwall and and Norwich um and and that's one route people also then you know leave academia at that point and go into a whole myriad of um other 
other um careers um and yeah it's it it is it's it's tricky because you know we we really need those people they mm. are they are the people mm. that are that are doing the the research on the lab bench you mm. know they they're actually producing all of that work uh, i couldn't possibly do that mm. myself mm. but how how do we make that a, a career that is reasonable <laughs> for people mm. Mm. and and yeah it's difficult and that is one of the aspects about the whole sort of whole career that that is pretty worrying mm. um and i mean even in terms of kind of science careers and so on i mean you know most people from my impression i mean correct me if i'm wrong or if the statistics are wrong or whatever but like it's most people i think who are into science if they want to they're either going to try and go into industry uh you know like a a, a good industry job or they're going to go teach in an academia and they don't you know like I, I suppose some people think there are some industry jobs but it is very much like i think most people just think they're going to end up teaching that would be my assumption is um, that fair i well <laughs> i think most people tell us that's what they want to do when they start their phd's they say mm. i want to i want to go into academia some people say oh i i really want to work in research i want to um work in crop development for example mm. and there are some very clear kind of roots roots <laughs> to that um through the through the phd there are some aspects there so you know i've had people who have gone into um uh science communication jobs or mm. into um sort of um uh what's the word <laughs> government um jobs so government statisticians for example mm. working for the nhs mm. um working for the civil service working for Defra. um exactly Environment agency. Yeah. yeah yeah um so there are lots of options and they're really skilled people <laughs> mm. who can mm. you know bring a lot to to any of any of those roles it's just that um the the academic jobs are pretty rare really mm, mm. um and so i feel tremendously lucky mm. um to have been able to to keep going and again that was not so uh, as i was getting towards the end of that last 3 year period in in norwich i was trying to write my own um grants to um remain employed yeah um i was going for lectureship jobs at, at other universities again leeds was the only one who would offer me a job so <laughs> you know that that made that e easy decision again <laughs> um so that was 10 years ago that i came back back to leeds and started yeah. uh, my own group and started teaching as well mm. i'd done i'd done bits and pieces of teaching so i had some training in that but then i also did a, um, a qualification once i i got to leeds mm -hmm which is, did, is something did they that, asked for that or you did that just no it's it's really encouraged yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, well, uh, as it should be <laughs> yes no absolutely because it it doesn't follow that um you know if you're, if you're good at the research that you're you're good at teaching yeah. it's a very different way of teaching mm. to you know secondary school sort of um, yeah, teaching yeah, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. it's very much more signposting mm -hmm. um supporting people to do their own independent discovery mm. um and and so that in that aspect it's you know it's quite different so mm. <laughs> um I, I suppose that's probably why you know the the qualification isn't required before you you start and then you you sort of train on the job and build build up that aspect um mm. whilst you're also trying to build up your research group but you still that need going. that skill set of being able to communicate and being able you know because it is or or just you know some basic people skills because if you have just been buried in books the whole time you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and the world's gone by and you're like what's happening oh I've got to teach this room full of people oh people yeah, yes <laughs> no <laughs> absolutely and um so yeah it doesn't always follow that 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 we're good at the mm. the same things mm. so that that was quite 
you know, I suppose the the thing that you're the thing that's new to you, the thing you you're just doing then is is the the thing that is hardest. Mm. And so, you know, I think though I think probably that transition from being the the kind of I, I was totally focused on research. Mm. I had a boss who ultimately was responsible for delivering it, even though, yeah. you know, I, I was doing it, but then transitioning into and now I've got so many different things to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, doing new things all of the time. Mm. Um it it was yeah, I think that that was probably one of the toughest transitions. Mm, mm. <laughs> but you know, it worked out okay. And mm. yeah, as I said, I've been here ten years. Was promoted to. I started out as a an academic fellow. I became a lecturer. Then mm. was promoted to associate professor. And then within that, I I was working in I or volunteering for. <laughs> um, uh, some leadership roles that sort of help the our research kind of environment mm. so most academics have to do some element of administration and, and that mm. sort of thing I kind of um you know initially I was given some some small roles and then I started to spot ones that I would prefer to do and so went yeah. for those sort of more proactively so I um initially was um so we have we have a setup at Leeds where we have seven faculties. Within those faculties, there are different numbers of schools. Um, so I volunteered to be our faculty um, champion for postdocs. So the, those are the people between PhD and, and lecturer position mm -hmm. so that I could um, advocate for them at faculty level. And then at university level, I could be a kind of conduit for what they wanted versus, you know, what aspects of of the sort of faculty were were impacting on on them and mm -hmm. and so I did that for a few years and then I became our school director of research and innovation mm -hmm. so that's a role that kind of supports colleagues in their in their research mm -hmm. and that can be lots of different aspects that that meant that I needed to sort of understand what all my colleagues were doing mm -hmm. <laughs> which I mean, I, I suppose luckily our school is fairly small, so I I kind of already had that that kind of understanding, mm -hmm. um, even though you know we, we're really quite diverse in in what we do, mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of putting people in touch with other people, suggesting different funding streams, mentoring people to um, if they had interviews for fellowships and and that sort of thing. So I did I did that for a couple of years. And part of that was also helping with the preparation of, so every seven-ish years, we have a nationwide assessment of research activity mm -hmm. um, across universities. And um, which, ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I can already tell it's a bunch of fun. It's a huge amount of fun. Mm. Um I think it's basically it, it, like an offstead for, you know, you're getting or an audit or you, exactly you, you're being yeah. where are all the receipts for this? Where did that paper <laughs> go? And so we have to put forward, you know, this is this is the research that we've done. Mm. The, this is the non-academic impact that it's had. This is mm. our environment that and how we support people to do research. And it is a massive undertaking, mm. um, especially somewhere the, the size of Leeds. But I think it does. um so this this exercise has been running is it three or four times so mm. far so from from the 90s mm. and i think it has changed the way we think about research and and what we should be doing and brought a little bit more focus and strategy to mm -hmm. to what we are doing mm. so i think in that aspect it, it it is useful i think it's useful to kind of benchmark yourselves and think about mm. well what, what are we good at uh, what other people see us as being good at for example does, does it have a nice balance of sort of I mean like is it profit focused or you know like is this research applicable to us to make money from does it have like quite strong ethics in it is it like a, what, what what's your read of it what what are the kind of things that they're looking at and so the the looking uh, across everything everything so the <laughs> the entirety of my research is absolutely not about 
the profit that can be made from it. It's not even necessarily about the non-academic impact, though that is part of. Mm. So we have to show, um, sort of showcase those aspects as well. Mm. But it's really about what is underpinning our global reputation as leaders in in research. Mm. What's the highest quality research that that we produce? And that and so that's what we put forward. So mm. it doesn't it only takes a, a snapshot of the research that we do. Mm. It it doesn't encompass everything. Um and uh, you know that every, every time we do this there are discussions about is this the right way to do it? Is it too burdensome for the outcome? Mm. But it actually so I think you know that it it has really important aspects to it. So we I think we we have a duty to show that we are mm-hmm. producing high quality research that is having both academic and non-academic impacts Mm. because as i said most of it is publicly funded so Mm. we have a responsibility to do that i think it 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 helps in sort of lobbying governments in terms of you know look look at what we have done Mm. we 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 are doing stuff right (laughs) i'm not just sitting around (laughs) um and uh, so i think that that's really important um i i'm it, it is it, it does take a lot of effort though from mm. lots of different people to prepare that that submission and then of course there are people who have to read all of that and mm. give their opinion about it mm. um and so uh, anyway i was i was involved in um the last submission which the results came out last year mm. and i was i was involved at um in a in a reasonably small way Mm -hmm. but through that I sort of came into contact with our um university level research um leaders Mm. and then this um role of dean of research quality came up and Mm. um I was asked to apply and I did and I got it (laughs) so um I've been doing that for about 18 months Mm -hmm. and it's been um I'm I'm really enjoying the combination of my my job now the Mm. being able to keep the aspects of my research and teaching going and take on this role which gives me a a sort of perspective across the whole university which has been difficult to understand what research means in different disciplines because Mm. it's it 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 does differ how it's assessed how it's supported do we have the environment that that can really support people to to do the best research that that they can we're very good at research we have a a Mm. really good reputation Obviously, there are there's variation in that across the university, but that gives us ideas of where we might need to to put in more support or slightly change focus. It's a big job. We have you know thousands of of academics who are yeah. doing it's just such di- diverse research, and so it it was initially very daunting. <laughs> Yeah. To to even work out what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> but then I, you know, I started taking up, you know, projects. So for example, making sure that across all of our faculties, people are being really clear about what the expectations are for researchers. What mm. do we expect them to be spending their time on and what do we value? Mm. So that that was one one aspect. I'm now doing a project that is looking at the support we give to research leadership how do we develop people to become the directors of research for example mm. and at the moment that can be really variable depending on who who had the job beforehand and what kind of handover they did that's another aspect that i'm looking at at the moment to see what can, what can we do to support that in a better way so yeah that, that's bringing lots of lots of different aspects and i'm coming into contact with a lot of um really interesting colleagues from across the university so yeah that's been really enriching if if don't <laughs> was it loads and loads of meetings when you kind of came into the role was it like okay now you need to get to this meeting this meeting this meeting this meeting i this mean meeting. it's like, still loads and loads of meetings yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean it was like a huge increase of like now you have to absorb all this knowledge really quickly and get up to speed like what's happening here here and here yes yeah, yeah. and that took a lot longer <laughs> And, yeah. you know, I was, I was pretty hard on myself. I was pretty sort of, well, you know, why, why are you not doing more? Mm. <laughs> it's because I didn't really understand enough to be no, able yeah, to. Yeah, you've got to catch up, yeah. Right. And I was also really conscious, you know, I, I came in at a time, you know, uh, obviously just, just 
well post covid sounds a really weird thing to say because we're not post covid mm. <laughs> um, but but post the the sort of the lockdowns and and mm. everything that came out of that and and so the the community had a really different feel to it i suppose mm. and I, I think they'd felt the focus was very much more on teaching mm. because of um what a you know the 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 impact of those lockdowns on our work had mm. meant that we had to you know the research did take a hit because we had to close labs for example throw mm. away experiments really quickly pivot to thinking about how we could do projects that that um changed how we did the research mm. um people who were doing how can we research when we're stuck in our homes and... right how many right. robots do we have access to <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think a lot of sort of you know looking at the literature and data mining it's suddenly starting to happen yeah. <laughs> which you know might might be a good thing actually <laughs> exactly i mean it's a, a refocus onto something else you, it might be a whole bunch of discoveries of mm. well actually we've produced all this stuff and no one's looked at it for ages like <laughs> have you looked at right. it it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly i think we we can get a little bit caught up in producing, producing more and more, more, data. And more yeah. yeah yeah so you know my, i'm i'm trying to see some positives as well as negatives to that time but mm. but also of course you know i think our students and our colleagues needed more mm. support during that time we had to switch the way we were teaching it entirely and that was mm. hard i mean one of the things that i teach is a field course which mm. is um you know it's really it's it's practical we take people away to a scottish island go to and, a field <laughs> right exactly now how do you do that online yeah. now we you know we got creative we we sort of found things to do that that kind of gave the same mm. um experience but it couldn't it could never kind of no. actually kind of make up for that that experience yeah. um but we did our very best but it that took you know um as I said, a lot of creativity, a lot of thinking differently. Um, mm. And, you know, probably that has had some really good impacts on now how we teach. I think it's also had some slightly negative impacts in terms of, um, uh, you know, we, we switched to all online and we had to do the very best that we could. And, and actually some of the things are better on mm. online and and mm. you know provide more access to more more people for example mm. so that that's really great but um you know i think it can also kind of engender an attitude that maybe you don't need to come onto campus maybe mm. you don't need to come to a lecture mm. if you can then just watch it and that really means that you don't get the same interaction with the lecturer you you don't get the same interaction with your peer group mm you know the the support networks were really impacted and mm. so getting over that idea that actually we can we can just do everything online i mean we mm. as i said did our very best <laughs> and mm. i think you know we're as successful as we could be in in that but mm. um i think i find it much more rewarding teaching face to face mm. um you know it, it can be really lonely just sort of talking to a screen and hoping that there are people there listening. well yeah hoping that people have got their cameras on and they're <laughs> listening and you know it's, it's yeah I, i've heard of people just talking to entire walls of just switched off cameras yeah yeah like, yep. i mean and... you're just gonna be like i mean this is kind of like this job <laughs> <laughs> i'm just talking and then that's it I was like, <laughs> like oh well <laughs> yes no uh, i mean it, it can be really difficult and yeah when you're not getting the the feedback from an audience essentially mm -hmm. you don't you don't know what's really going down yeah, well you don't know if they're bored if they're excited or, <laughs> you know. right so yeah. i think that a lot of that interaction is so so important um mm. uh, and so yeah i think we're just coming out of that we're, we're kind of getting back to the you know, we, we brought some aspects with us, as I said, there's a lot more support on like in, in terms of um, the research, we we've kind of realized that we can um, collaborate internationally, not necessarily having to travel <laughs> all mm. the time. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I have a, a European network that I'm one of the leaders of and, and you know, I meet 
colleagues from across Europe regularly to mm-hmm. for that and we can do all of that online and now we understand that that is mm. you know a, a really useful way of of doing things so there are some aspects that have been positive in in that sense I mean and it's it, like generally is more efficient because if you think of the I mean yeah it's great to be in a room with a person and have that like direct communication but when they're in another country like it's not to, to get into that room with them like the amount of effort that you have to make to get into that space with them to get that knowledge and the access mm-hmm. is huge and it's like an expenditure I don't think we can easily justify as much anymore no no I don't think so I think and and again that's probably not a bad thing to make us no. think more about about yeah. that yeah um and to you know to really think about what what's needed and I do think you know sometimes some face-to-face is is needed mm. you know to to get in a room together but mm. but actually you can do a lot without doing without doing mm. that um and so yeah I think in some ways it it almost expanded our horizons because we we suddenly thought you know if we 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 wouldn't have asked an international um colleague to come and give a talk for an hour Mm. (laughs) but but we can now um Mm. and uh so i think that that aspect is is been enriching as as well Mm. i mean undeniably there have been impacts and i think certain groups have been more impacted than than others obviously people carrying responsibilities have been you know more more impacted and we're we're starting to see that in terms of Mm. you know their um what they've been producing over Mm. over that time and and i think we have to be really aware of that and actually Mm. my my colleague who is so we have another um dean of research dean of research culture Mm. um who's kat davis and and she has been she wrote a, a great report about about this and so we you know we're taking that um seriously and 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 also trying to think about lessons learned from from that that time and and maybe mm. w- what we could hopefully do um in the future because obviously we don't <laughs> we're really hoping that that's not going to happen again but mm. something might happen again that mm. that puts us into that situation or simply you know changing the way that we do business as usual might mm. actually be beneficial um mm. So, you know, more flexibility in, in working is is probably overall <laughs> beneficial to our Yeah, our I mean, we haven't, like, yeah, there, there's just going to be so many changes. Like, for, for me, it's such a, just a real line of, like, there's pre-COVID and then there's now. Mm. Um, and, yeah, like, we 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 haven't reckoned with any changes or anything yet. Like, I, I mean, you've touched upon some of the, so my questions around COVID are normally around um, the kind of long-term effects and you kind of touched on that. Um, so I want to look at your experience of going into lockdown, like, and how long you were locked down for and what that experience was like, like sort of initially it was sort of the rush of, um, you know, like everything changing, was that initial period i mean were you just you went home and you had to wait for it to deliver a laptop or was it <laughs> the, the the laptop was in your hand and you went home and you'd had 500 you know extra hours of work to do like what was <laughs> what was it like immediately and then sort of some of the progression how you remember it basically yeah it was it was tough and so at, at that because i was at that point um in a sort of school leadership sort of role um I remember yeah, I, everyone's I was, asking you questions <laughs> right and you know I was, I was going around to individual well <laughs> you know we, we'd been sort of seeing students um starting to wear masks mm. and that was that was quite new and we were all sort of kind of saying oh this is oh this is something's going on here <laughs> and you know as it was progressing to you know towards Europe and then towards uh, towards the UK and and it 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 was clearly going 
going to hit and and we didn't really have any idea and it really sort of happened quickly and Mm. I mean it was it was very emotional actually you know I was trying to go around support colleagues make sure that they knew for example how to use their cloud um, Mm. computing so some of some of my colleagues weren't using that and so they were unsure how they were going to access their files from home Mm. so you know things that we hadn't hadn't even occurred to us but also we had to yeah we had to shut down the the buildings but then you know we had we had no idea how long we were going Mm. to be shut down for and you know i used life flies things that were if we simply allowed everything to die would take us so long to recover and such mm. a lot of money as well to recover mm. that you know I, ha- I have colleagues working on other other insects for mm. for example there are but lots of experiments just had to stop like mm. we had to say to a you know a student who'd um been working on uh, some of my students work on lifespan experiments and mm. you know they're two months into an experiment and it's just like no you're just going to have to not do that anymore mm. so we had people who you know we asked for exceptions to just come in to maintain stocks so that once we could come back in we we could get started more quickly so there were a very very few people who Mm. were allowed to do that so Mm. um you know i i was involved in in organizing um that and making the the case for why that that was needed but yeah I, I remember having a little bit of a cry on a colleague's shoulder as I was sort of you know the, I don't I don't know what's going to happen from here and I know that I have to be kind of strong for my colleagues were you under any illusion at the beginning like when every you know when people were saying oh this will blow over or anything like because I'm thinking as a biologist do you I mean did you were you aware of it incoming or was it kind of like na 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 and then it hits and you're kind of did you start devouring like the paperwork and the research and stuff like how how far down the rabbit hole did you fall <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it's it it's um not exactly my area of expertise mm. however mm. you know i know people who work in wildlife disease for example who but for everyone years, became an expert all of a sudden didn't well they? All, <laughs> all of a sudden except that people who were experts have been warning for yeah. years <laughs> that this this is something that is you know potential to happen and we have a big group of um virologists at, at leeds as well mm. um and so you know this um I suppose it it was there have been outbreaks of other um diseases previously that that have been locally really damaging mm. but didn't get the kind of well SARS um, right exactly SARS Ebola for example yeah um and so I guess initially it wasn't sort of clear which way that was going to go mm. and then suddenly it was mm. oh no this is this is everywhere it is deadly and that was really frightening (laughs) and I I suppose it was really frightening to think about the response to it um Mm. from our leaders and you know well there are different ways of handling that weren't there those first few weeks though it was just I think I think everybody was slightly in a little a little bit of denial of okay it's it's going to be a couple of weeks we'll just let this blow through and mm. and and then we'll go back to oh mm, it's maybe going to be six weeks mm. okay well that means we're going to have to start thinking about certain things a bit differently because that's going to start impacting you know like the field course for example that I was talking mm. about and then you start thinking okay well when when will this when end will this will end? it end <laughs> and how far are we going to need to plan Mm. and actually i think it's i mean for for everyone it was it was that uncertainty is so so difficult and you um, couldn't explain it to anyone if they weren't there like it's like we all kind of know but you couldn't you couldn't tell anyone what that experience was like no no really really not. we're all working on assumptions of kind of like oh you remember that thing and that thing that happened but it was like 
no you can't you can't describe that it was and it was so because it was so long you went through so many you know ups and downs and mm. you know boredom and this is nice and oh god it's awful and that's terrible mm. <laughs> I'm really scared I'm so bored of it I, I don't <laughs> care about anything <laughs> I mean, just the yeah, the whole gamut of emotions, and actually, some some of the obviously in in terms of of research that that, that came out of that. Yes, there's the um, the basic biology about the the virus itself, mm. um, and how to you know the, the sort of medical aspects of of how to deal with it. But there's there's also the um, so. Um, some of my colleagues work on um, airflow in in buildings, for example. Mm, that's a big Suddenly thing as well at the moment. Became massive. Yeah. All <laughs> right, something that probably we hadn't really thought about. Mm. You know, very generally, it was suddenly, oh no, actually, that that mm. is huge, and also the mental health aspects of you know, in ways that probably we didn't we didn't even think about. I mean, yes, getting ill has mental health ramifications but mm. you know the, the that uncertainty that being alone <laughs> for think, a lot of the time you know I it's... think it's had an effect on the idea of individualism as well like you know the sort of I think it's I don't know but uh, there's a possibility that the rampant individualism is kind of maybe a little bit tempered by that, you know, like after the experience, especially people who are alone or who are distant or, you know, you have family members who you think of that are, you know, you think of them somewhere else and they're on their own and it's fine because it's day to day and stuff. But when all of a sudden it's like no one can go out, you become hyper aware of these sort of things. Uh, and... Absolutely. And I think, you know, potentially this is, we we haven't even understood no what, what actually the the implications are going to be long long term um and yeah it's um very a very odd time for everyone and and just so so worrying I mean Mm. I um I am lucky in that nobody close to me died Mm. um i know a few people who have long covid and it has Mm. really impacted them i mean Mm. in ways that um you know academics we spend a lot of time thinking if Mm. you get something that impacts your ability to think Mm. (laughs) it's uh it it's hugely demoralizing you can't you know you can maybe physically feel okay but actually you can't hold a conversation for very long mm. that's uh incredibly difficult to to sort of um come to terms with and, and then work through mm. um, and it's one of those things that kind of can be you know it can be thought of like slightly invisible and that people mm. can dismiss and then you've got the same thing that we even saw with covid it's like when there's a new disease it's people like no it doesn't even exist it wasn't here before it can't be here now <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, there's a period of time where, so, you know, you think of something like PTSD that you hear about all the time, but the amount of time that took to be socially accepted, and, mm. you know, from Vietnam syndrome through to all sorts of different things. But I, yeah, it's, yeah, we're not, we're not going to know what this has done for years and years. I don't yeah, know. I don't, I don't think so. And, you know, try, try and look at some of the positives, but obviously massive amount of negatives. I think it's really interesting in terms of how, you know, looking at people's responses to information about the disease and about the vaccine. That's mm-hmm. that, again, is, you know, probably huge fodder for, for research and understanding how mm-hmm. how people respond to different types of information and where they're getting information from and, and mm-hmm. how they're using Trust. it trust in general because you know it's uh you can't exist without trust so it's where your trust's lying Mm. and then when things are uncertain it's like what can i grab onto Mm. and i do wonder if if we were unfortunate in the sort of the, the point at which it hit where we'd had some aspects of um uh a, a sort of diminishing in, in trust of experts, I suppose. Mm. You know, you think about coming out of the 90s in terms of um, CJD and mad cow disease and how that was handled and mm. and did the experts really know what, what they were talking about? And then mm. I think there has been a bit of a sort of um, an undermining of 
of that expertise perhaps in 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 certain quarters you know not not mm. across the board and I, I do wonder if if you know that that interaction was was actually really unhelpful for us that had had that struck at a different time you know a different sort of yeah slightly slightly different societal aspects that, that actually the response would would have been a bit a bit different but um yeah that's uh, also going to be fodder for future historians oh, yeah, yeah. as well. Of speculation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, on you, your own mental health, well-being, and your own kind of being able to separate. Like, did you have an office at home? Were you working at the end of the bed? So I don't know whether it's um, well. In some aspects, I was lucky in, uh, in that I had a separate room that I could use as a, as an office, and was able to set that up. I mean, I I've never particularly enjoyed working at home Mm. and as soon as I could I was coming back into the office I spent quite a lot of time walking along the canal yeah Yeah. and and the river that would be my yeah my go-to place what was the best wildlife you saw did you catch anything that you'd not seen before (laughs) not that I'd not seen but there are loads of herons down there yeah yeah brilliant love the herons and actually there's there's one that comes to the university now it's got quite a reputation (laughs) It's got its own Twitter account, um, and uh, it's on the sort of little pond that I can see from my office. So, nice. yeah, quite quite like seeing the the heron. Yeah. Um, but I realised so I I can't quite remember when it was that we were allowed to then go a little bit further from from home. But mm. uh, whenever it was, and I I met a friend on a on a walk and was able to kind of look out across some fields Mm. and I realized that I hadn't looked at anything that far away Mm. for a really long time and that Mm. was incredible Mm. (laughs) you know everything had been you know right in front of me and then I could see for miles and that uh, that was uh, yeah so astonishing (laughs) yeah I think like we all saw stuff that we would never have seen or would never expect to see or just like oh <laughs> this is so unprecedented for right <laughs> and yeah. and suddenly yeah looking at the those fields like I've seen this this type of image mm. so often in my life and mm. I have taken it for granted mm. and now I'm able to to just yeah look Run around that in it open <laughs> space right <laughs> Um, so yeah, and I, I guess I never, um, the well, you, you, often you don't realize what you're missing in, in, until it is, it is gone. And, and so I suppose I realized, um, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't comprehended myself that I liked the separation of work and, and mm. home, even mm. though it's still, um, <sighs> academia is not a nine to five job. Mm. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I always have had to work outside mm. of hours and sometimes that's at home. And so um, I, I just, I just hadn't understood that that, that was going to impact me as much as it did. Mm. Um, I guess I didn't really um, understand. I'm quite a huggy person and I didn't, mm. <laughs> I didn't know that that was mm. not just a a way that I communicate, but a thing that I needed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess. That's making me of... think of gene expressions again and your fruit flies, you see. <laughs> I I would put money on, I don't, I don't know, but I would put money mm. on that, that actually getting a hug changes your gene expression. I would mm. absolutely put money on that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even, even that sort of aspect, that was really mm. astounding to me. Um, mm. And all the time, well, unless your time was just filled wall to wall with work, but all the time, and you can see why a lot of people sort of were drinking a lot more because it was just like all this time, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I've I've watched everything on Netflix, <laughs> yeah. um, and I and I think it, there there was also sort of the yeah, I was really like, well, I'm I'm going to have to keep myself to some sort of schedule, otherwise, mm. I'm going to go completely off the rails here. Mm. What can I do to actually keep keep that, um, and not just to try to keep work to within some sort of boundary? Yeah, so like, I didn't. 
gives shape to things so yeah. it's not all just monotonous you know right yeah exactly yeah. and uh yeah I didn't I didn't start drinking so much but you know there was there was a lot of chocolate eaten and <laughs> you know um I couldn't go swimming anymore so I, thought, I was mm. like oh I'm gonna have to try yoga <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know <laughs> I I I did it but it, it was yeah it was very difficult I wasn't not, doing it uh, for you it, no it's not the same no, no. it's not the same no. <laughs> So yeah, it was. Um, uh, I mean, uh, eye opening, I suppose, but also yeah, monotonous. And mm. you know, looking forward to that one trip to the the supermarket a week, and bizarrely, th- like standing in a queue to get into mm. a Sainsbury's. I'm just mm. like this is crazy. <laughs> I've still got a memory of, <laughs> of taking someone to the supermarket, and I was waiting for them in the car, and. Um, just all the people queuing outside and it was like a wintry day it was all like gray and miserable and you know I was like god this is just so dystopian <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this, this is where we live now <laughs> everyone in mass walking around mm-hmm. it's really gray it's like oh what this this is this is real this is real <laughs> and it no it, I mean it did feel like being in a movie a lot of the time yeah yeah <laughs> so it's, it's like this this ridiculous thing that would happen only in Hollywood is is now happening, and that mm. happens all the time now. <laughs> it, yeah, no, it it does. So I yeah, I didn't want to live through interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was was happy with some you know quiet times, but that's mm. not what we've got. So. Mm. <laughs> all right, well, you've given me a great segue there. I'm going to move us off COVID because <laughs> I'm being really slow and like I said, I was going to be disciplined, but I'm being terrible. <laughs> um, so let's go on to we, we'll avoid Brexit and go straight to climate change. Um, I will okay. come back to Brexit, but right. <laughs> um, so my question on climate change, similar to the COVID one, I uh, want to look at how it affects your work mainly because um, obviously Leeds is a city that has declared a climate emergency. Um, what can you do in your work, or what do you do in your work that? promotes awareness or adaptation mitigation and so on um i mean obviously your work will be affected by climate change i mean immediately think of you know the huge die-off of insects um yeah so what what's what's your response (laughs) Uh, i mean yeah this is the this is the biggie i mean Mm. this is this is going to impact everything Mm. and you know, I think we need to show more more leadership in trying trying to mitigate what's what is coming towards us. Mm. In terms of specifically my work, actually, it's something that has kind of interacted with my work throughout. It's been one of the aspects that made me want to understand biology and how that's going to be impacted by a changing climate. Mm. Um, it's something that that is also something really interesting to our students so it's something that we link you know different aspects of of our work to Mm -hmm. and to kind of link the what can be I suppose slightly sometimes you know if you think about the really fundamentals of biology it can be a bit esoteric but you can you can really quickly link it to real world applications when you when you think about climate change so yeah it's it's been in my teaching throughout it's now an increasing part of my research so Mm. I have a a project um with a a bunch of collaborators in the European network that I mentioned earlier is about how climate change is going to impact fertility so Mm. not just of insects but that's where we started Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's a really underappreciated effect of Mm. climate change because Mm. most of our predictions about what's going to happen to biodiversity and to where species will be able to live in the future Mm. under you know and what species and what species can live exactly these are these are largely based on the temperatures at which they can survive up until Mm -hmm. and um, you also don't know what will happen to them before they reach those tolerance points because you could activate again it's gene expression isn't it you you could activate different yeah sorry (laughs) no no you're you're exactly there that's that's brilliant so um 
unfortunately <laughs> you biologists haven't been quite as quick mm. um and so whilst people have been kind of looking at the effect of heat on reproduction mm. um what i did with um my colleague tom price from from liverpool um a few years ago was to have a project where we looked across um more than 40 fly species mm-hmm. And we looked at um, male fertility and the so the temperature that they could remain fertile at and the temperature that they could survive um, up to. Mm. And what we found is that for about well, there's a lot of variation, one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also for about half of those species, they become entirely sterile at temperatures that are lower than those that they can survive at. So mm. by a, by up to a couple of degrees sometimes, mm. and that's entirely sterile they they cannot reproduce and so if they can't reproduce the population is going to go extinct do you know what i'm thinking straight away <laughs> like i always say for me children of men is the best film of this century <laughs> and it just gets more relevant all the time mm-hmm. and uh, you just saying that i'm like oh god it's children of men five years <laughs> right well indeed <laughs> So so now we've understood, OK, we've got we've got this variation. We've got this serious problem that that actually. So if you also use the um, that data on fertility, their fertility temperatures, mm. it better predicts where they live now. Mm-hmm. And so we think that would be a better prediction of where they can live in the future. And so mm-hmm. actually, you know, for those species, we've overestimated what they can where they, they will be able to survive. So mm-hmm. that is worrying we Mm -hmm. we're not so at the moment though we're not sure um you know how widespread that phenomenon really is Mm -hmm. beyond flies Mm -hmm. it's known for example in the pig industry it's been known for a long time that during the summer pigs become um they can go through periods of infertility Mm. and so you know that there are various sort of indicators that this is quite a big problem (laughs) and may well get you know, more problematic. So one of the things we're doing at the moment is starting a project to try and understand the biology that's making some species more vulnerable mm-hmm. um, or or more robust to mm. temperature in, in terms of sperm production. Mm. And it seems, you know, what, one of the things we're also trying to do across this network, and it's, it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge uh, operation, but we're trying to kind of mind the literature and understand what do we know already yeah one of one of the things seems to be um that or there's an idea that male fertility is more sensitive to female fertility mm-hmm. we don't know quite yet if that is accurate across lots of different species mm-hmm. so that's one thing that we're trying to do with with this network of people is is mm. try and get all of that data together mm-hmm. and understand those those kind of broad patterns so um yeah it's it's giving us quite a focus <laughs> mm. um in in terms of trying to understand that and trying to understand the the ramifications of that for mm. for i mean any species that we want to try to conserve any species that we use which is you know most species <laughs> mm. and us uh, I, I, how and, long we want to and us keep... yeah, yeah. So I have, um, so this project kicks off tomorrow. I have a new postdoc Mm -hmm. and he's from India uh, originally. Mm -hmm. And he tells me that there are, um, there are sort of uh, cool refuges. So men are Mm. are encouraged to go to um, spend a night in a a sort of cool hotel Mm. so that to try to preserve their fertility. And, Mm. and I don't know if we know if that's an effective way of, of doing that Um, or even what kind of, um, you know, whether this is going to be a, a problem for humans you know generally the temperatures last year in in india you know hitting 50 sort of regularly in places and and that for prolonged periods Mm -hmm. and already we're hitting ridiculous temperatures in february Mm -hmm. around the world and like but that's creating a, a load of data but we also have much better tools to process that data at faster speeds and scales and so on it's kind of a it's kind of a race, but then it's sort of things unfolding in real time as well. Like, how much do we know about previous extinction events, for example, of like how 
much do we know about resilience or recovery or anything. I would imagine that the date is quite sparse because there was no one around to record it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it really so my my colleagues who work in paleo ecology uh, mm. uh, that's exactly what they try to un- understand. Mm. One of the aspects is you know under because obviously the climate has changed in the past mm. nowhere near as rapidly <laughs> as mm. as now. Um, mm. But um, there have been you know big extinction events. Mm. So trying to understand from the fossil record, Mm. trying to understand from um, existing species and trying to um, um, work out the evolution of those species Mm -hmm. gives us gives us some kind of uh, ability to look into the past Mm. and, and to try to understand, you know, what what might need more help to overcome this. I mean, as a sort of in evolutionary biology terms um you know eventually the earth's going to be fine mm. we aren't <laughs> mm. we i i imagine we probably would like to remain on a livable earth so mm. you know the, i the, would the, personally well, you know um, <laughs> especially as i'm getting older you know I'd, I'd like it to be less on fire and less flooded and less diseasey yeah possible. yeah that that would be great um <laughs> so if we could all just do that but it's diff, it's diff, you know it's it's tricky and i think there are lots of you know that that's my own research and and i've sort of mentioned how um covid sort of made us think about how we collaborate internationally and we don't mm. need to travel so that is one aspect that mm. i think we really can seriously think about how much international travel we're doing and mm. is it necessary mm. that's a good thing mm. there are um initiatives is it even feasible anymore right <laughs> <laughs> well that's another <laughs> question <laughs> But, you know, how um, we do our research and how sustainable it is, you know, what what we're using in terms of plastics in mm. in the lab, for example, or energy. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we should we should be looking at, the, at these things, mm. but it's, it takes time to think of ways around that and then to socialize that that change and so the first um, thing's looking at it isn't it the first thing you know it's it's like with any addiction sort of thing there's like the first thing is deal with it you know like admit it to yourself like look at what you're doing look at the impact and again it's like that process of review and consideration and like is this what what we're doing um you know and are we doing it right and is it the right thing to do and are we going about it the right way and so on Exactly. And, and you know, probably there are there are different options that you could take and then you have to weigh up well, what's what's the best thing to do and how mm. quickly can we implement that? Um, so, you know, it's not an easy time that I mean, there are uh, really there's some really positive technology that that is is available to mm. us, but we need to be able to use that. So, again, I think that's where universities can be really really impactful in helping our students to think about that and having them be ambassadors you know in whatever line of work they're doing afterwards to to always keep keep an eye to that as well and, so and there's an industrial expectation now the whole arguments that environmentalists are making about you know highlighting this that and the other but at the same time there is there is a big industry shift there is there is more industry focus. There's a lot of greenwashing, sure, mm. but there are like people, and and some of that's serious. You know, a lot of people are cynical with stuff, but a lot of people do. Even if someone's doing a greenwash thing, say, people will buy into that because they're already bought into that, and they, you know, they'll flock towards that kind. Of, does that make sense? Mm. Am I explaining what I mean there? Of, you know people believe in the thing and that they might get disappointed if it doesn't do the thing but that doesn't necessarily mean they give up on their beliefs they might then go on to something else and you know information diffuses yeah absolutely and and just you know the the motivations behind doing the thing might not be all that we would want them to be but maybe that you know it's it's still not a bad thing yeah 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 so um, I don't know. I, I I flip between being utterly pessimistic and 
a little bit more optimistic. Do you travel less now? Are you using less carbon to get into work personally, for example? Uh, are you, were you always on the bus or did you always walk or whatever? I've, yeah, I've walked walked to work um, for the last 10 years. And that's mm. actually um, part of my choice about where to live is that I wanted mm. a walkable distance um, mm. for, for a number of reasons. But certainly, you know, climate impact is is one thing um i yeah i mean you're aware of it already so i mean if you're anything like me it's something that's wrecking your head all the time (laughs) (laughs) oh i've just i've just unwrapped a thing oh my god this plastic and you know yeah and and thinking about you know i love i love a bacon sandwich i love Mm. you know i do like meat but there, there are better meats than others. Mm. Oh, so thinking about actually that that component of uh, of what I'm eating and and thinking about so for example you know when we have conferences um, uh, the, there's quite a big move now to make everything vegan mm. you know just just a standard. Mm. There's quite a big move to have instead of yeah having everybody together mm. in one country having sort of hubs. Yeah. so that you can travel by train all in one country and, and gather together rather mm. than you know lots of people flying um so yes we we are starting to to take that more seriously and i think you know i think that's a, that's only right if we don't then mm. Mm. you know who who is going to take that seriously I, i'm sure there's there's still much more we we can do there's yeah but the, it, i do think there's momentum there i mean it's frustrating at the the high level and the visible level you know people flying down the road to attend some photo opportunity mm. but like it's um you know re- real people normal people serious people are, <laughs> are doing things yeah i mean as you say it would be nice if uh it'll come it'll come (laughs) because uh, you know as behaviors change as well i mean like you know it's it it, things look bleak and the story has been bleak but the the story i've seen a lot of effort now to kind of change flip the script to change the narrative (laughs) like whatever whatever trait term you want to use but there is there is a change and there is a change in how people are telling the story of like not just pointless hope but like let's be realistic and what can we realistically mm. do and these kind mm. of things so and and as people look at it more yeah yeah I I I, I think it's happening more than um definitely more than it's reported anyway yeah and I, I I'm you know I think people people younger than me are are on board and they're they are the ones who are you know really gonna have to deal with the the sharp end of this um, some are some are that are coming <laughs> to biology classes and so on it, well but, you yeah know, you've got yeah. other people going to other classes that are like nah well to be fair a lot of those people who are like nah aren't going to the classes any classes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know i think there are there are reasons for hope um mm. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to be completely, you know, doom, doom laden about, mm-hmm. about it all. Um, mm-hmm. But I think we do need to be realistic that, you know, we're, we're in a situation now where things are changing rapidly and, and mm-hmm. um, we have limited ability to do anything about maybe some of that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's more that we can do. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a real <laughs> lot, a real lot more that we could be doing right, right? now. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, when's the best time to have done something? Well, probably, you know, a week ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But when's the second best time? Well, it's it's now, isn't it? Now, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Right, let's do Brexit then. <laughs> <laughs> now we've had some fun with climate change. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, with Brexit... Has there been any effect on your work? I mean, we've we've brexited now. Have you noticed any change in your work? If so, has the change been good, bad, neutral? Can you have a neutral change? You can't have a neutral change, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so no change. I mean, it's it's all going swimmingly. It's what a what a 
brilliant decision. I mean, we're doing our very best to, mm. you know, but um, supply chains, every, yeah. everything is slower and yeah. gets caught up. Mm. Uh, even kind of, um, you know, be, being able to send things between labs more difficult. Mm. Um, everything's more expensive. So mm. being able to deliver, you know, even if you've got a grant in, being able to deliver what you said you were going to deliver, mm. difficult. Mm. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I've mentioned this a number of times. It, it, research is it's a really international activity. We are enriched mm. by that sort of global view. Mm -hmm. And this has been devastating <laughs> in terms mm. of, you know, from um, it, the uncertainty about what we were going to be able to be part of mm. um, the the student exchange programs that, mm. you know, we I mean, things are changing rapidly this week. Mm. I don't quite know the full ramifications of, of what has happened. So with the with the change in in Northern Ireland, so that um, some of the immediate news was that we would be able to be an associate uh, member of what's called Horizon Europe. So this is um, the biggest research funder across Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to do massively well out mm. of out of this. We absolutely got more out of it than we put in. Mm. Um, and it enabled us to be so it didn't didn't just provide the funding for those projects, but enabled us to think on, on a pan European scale to set up mm. those networks, to set up those those bigger projects. Mm. Now, it, it, through the all of the uncertainty, you know, even though um, we were told, OK, if we leave Horizon Europe and people have those European funded, mm. um, they've won the, those um, grants, um, that the UK funder would pick up the, that difference. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think it was just Tuesday, suddenly 1.6 billion vanished out of that that budget. Mm. that tends uh, to have an effect on things i mean you can't plan <laughs> yeah you can't you can't you know so people were you know worried about do i even bother putting in this this application yeah. um from from the other side our colleagues in europe are just thinking of well, what's the point in having you know the, do we do we have these people from the uk on this mm. grant because it's going to be a whole extra level yeah, it's of a load of hassle right yeah. i think that there have been decisions made made there because of that that mm. that mean that we're probably not involved with things that we would have been involved with and so you know the all of that uncertainty we, we've now been told that um we will be able to be associate members that would be brilliant that would be a huge step forward but let's not forget before that decision was made we, this this was something that we 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 just had access to we just yeah, did yeah and it hugely um and the choice was made to not continue it as well yeah like, it wasn't it wasn't like it just suddenly dropped off overnight because we had you know how it was several years of fighting over brexit <laughs> before this decade <laughs> you know the i mean i i will never understand what what happened there it it is for uh, you know you, you have a set of people that that say we want um the uk to be a research and innovation superpower mm. but we're gonna cut the legs off of mm. that mm. <laughs> um, and... i'm gonna be the smartest person ever by locking myself <laughs> in this room and never talking to anyone or looking at any yes. other books other than what i have <laughs> i i can't no, I I will never get over this as long as I live. Mm. And and the the sort of soft kind of it's not just about that sort of hard funding aspect, but the sort of soft reputational aspect mm. Mm. of uh you know we one of one of the big public goods that the UK produces is our research output. That that's mm. you know you can look at OECD figures on on that, and 
you know that's this is just so undermining to that and the ability to attract the best people to the the uk to do the research well it's it's really not as attractive anymore (laughs) you know even if they they can come you i mean often if we're talking about people who are in those postdoctoral research positions for example they are highly skilled workers visas are i mean you know there's a process to go through Mm. but often that it's it's reasonably straightforward but i'm not even talking about that just the people wanting to apply to Mm. come to the uk at the moment i'm talking quite a lot about personal anecdotal sort of experience Mm. about what my colleagues are saying and Mm the pity <laughs> from my my uh colleagues in in sweden and germany <laughs> you know just like what's going on now i'm like i don't know i don't know what's happening um <laughs> however bad you think it is over there from outside it's worse here it's yeah. worse in it <laughs> and i just it it is just unfathomable you know just um so yeah uh it is bad then not 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 being a good impact on your work it's not been brilliant Mm. (laughs) you know i just um i and i couldn't have predicted it yeah absolutely didn't 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 predict i do know one colleague who uh who who did had written into their um their European grant the if if Brexit did happen that they would move to move to Sweden mm. and I thought I, you know I'd, I'd heard of that I was like what that's <laughs> why, not happen why are we writing this <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so I just um yeah it's uh incredibly disheartening and also mm. just think about all of the the lost opportunities mm. the time and energy and resources that have gone into this ridiculous <laughs> exercise mm, mm, mm. and will go into i suppose first trying to mitigate the mm. absolute disaster and then hopefully you know some sort of reversal <laughs> just um but yeah i mean i i can i can only hope um, yeah, well, it, it goes back to that. Um, as someone put it the other day, I think it was something I'd seen on Twitter. It was like deciding to go it alone during during a, a climate crisis. You're not going to get very far with that. It's uh, you need I other just, people. I don't understand what you know what the, what the concept is. It's like how, given how globally connected um, mm. we are, mm. and and that has to have a geographical aspect to it well i wouldn't you know (laughs) but then you have the covid hit as well and then the way that you know again with supply chains it's this sort of oh we can't do this we can't well we can't do this because if you know one part if one factory in the supply chain that i don't know produces whatever ball bearings chips you know if they're closed down because of a pandemic or they they they're hit by a national uh natural disaster flood fire whatever they're gone and then that and because everything's super concentrated that's the world supply of that gone essentially and you know from toiletries to food to medicine to like you know and uh, as we know from masks and ventilators and stuff it's like you you can't do that you you're not going to get very far if you're doing that and so there is a level of like you need to bring home industrial capacity and so on like so there's all sorts of things that are going to happen that are, will that are already being forced and necessitated just by circumstance outside of you know the political theater and so mm, on mm. and and in some ways i guess we're we're uh, running a bit of an experiment of what happens when um you know the the areas where we we get certain food crops what happens mm-hmm. when they can't grow those anymore <laughs> mm-hmm. and i'm so happy to be in real time running that mm-hmm. running that experiment mm-hmm. but i suppose it you know it it is um uh education about those those supply chains and how vulnerable certain mm-hmm. aspects mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. and and actually where we need to get more 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 serious so Mm. you know uh, i suppose uh, trying trying to look for some 
positive like i'm i'm really scraping <laughs> scraping the barrel no, no, on positives no, here but there's, there's no positive <laughs> <laughs> so now i'm going to move on to social media <laughs> unless i like i'll give you an opportunity to kind of sum up if you want to finish any any point on there but uh, <laughs> I, th- I think I think I, I, I yeah, probably I was, made myself. I was hoping I was giving you an out <laughs> rather than shutting you off. So um, social media. Um, I ask about this because more and more people have to do social media as part of their work or they are doing it um, as their job or, um, you know, their boss makes them do it, <laughs> sell, <laughs> sell products or whatever. <laughs> like do a dance for us for TikTok. Um <laughs> So do you have to do much social media for your work? And if so, how much time do you spend on it? And do you think that time is actually valuable to your role? Does it give you benefit? Mm. Like, I mean, it's not a, a compulsory aspect of my role. And I'm a really late adopter. Mm. <laughs> so uh, so I, I suppose in that sense, um, you know I'm, I'm only really starting to uh, understand the impact it could have so mm. you know being on twitter and able to again re- reach this global community of researchers and mm. to spot research that's happening that i might not have been aware of mm. without just you know being able to see that little little tweet and being able to share our work as well mm-hmm. um i you know there, there are definite benefits there that has to be tempered with you can spend an awful lot of time on that and honestly I don't know the um how much time you have to sort of input to get the the presence in order to make it worthwhile in doing that Mm. I'm not really Mm. sure but but it's one thing that we so our library are running next couple of weeks as a sort of um what are they calling it a researcher profile boot camp so essentially Mm. um trying to make people more aware of of how this could help their sort of mm. research profile and and to get their messages out there to perhaps mm. an audience that that might not have picked it up otherwise mm. and there's certainly some evidence that that it does help in terms of um you know having having more reads of of your work and and mm. then um citations there's also there is also a little bit of a trade off um you know when you look at um at, actual academic outputs versus number of tweets for example mm. um, they don't always uh, go hand in hand so. well the more you tweet the more lo- the more you look like you're working ironically <laughs> i guess i guess so uh, i think it can probably well, obviously be... you're tweeting it's like you're not working <laughs> yeah pictures uh, or it didn't happen um uh, so i think uh, it it can be useful it can be a massive time cut kind of yeah. and it can but it's not something that you're forced into or you you know or there's a massive expectation from funders of like we want this many social followers or like, no, we want no. to see posts we want to know what's happening <laughs> So it 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 sort of feeds into you know some of the metrics we use to understand how how much our our research is used can mm-hmm. can include um sort of press and and social media as as well mm-hmm. so that it, it can give us a sort of handle on you know how how broadly something is being um shared and so maybe that gives us an idea about the impact but i think we have to be careful about Mm. using those those sorts of metrics to really kind of um make any value judgment on on how good that research is Mm, because you Um, could go down like a a sort of seo route of like you know what are funders looking for and what the keyword you know like that kind of so, which I don't know. Maybe it could yield some benefits, or maybe it could just be cynical, or maybe you just end up doing the same thing. Or um, I think ultimately, um, academics are not necessarily very swayed, or at least in my field, particularly swayed by social media. So, so the the prime thing is that mm. that kind of uh, research paper, mm. and so you know creating more of a buzz around it through social media mm. it, it could be helpful but it's it's not the the thing that we're you know we're not craving followers <laughs> we're not mm. um, and i uh, potentially we're not 
even massively good at using it i think there are some people on the who who are mm. and have, have been really successful and i guess it it also opens up to a different type of audience perhaps in terms mm. of you know um obviously people who are not academics mm. uh, also kind of um accessing the work and and so that's got that's got to be a good thing and mm. probably quite a low cost and i mean cost in terms of you know both time and, and money um way of way of doing that so you know I, I can definitely see benefits but it's not uh yeah it's not it's not compulsory and it's not for example something that we would um use to assess how somebody's progressing for example mm-hmm. um yet <laughs> mm-hmm um yeah i can't i can't see it making it into you know or directly into sort of promotions criteria but um i i suppose um being able to to show how you're interacting beyond academia is is a really good thing you know we although a lot of our research is is fundamental and we're really trying to progress ideas Mm -hmm. we don't want them to be um completely disjointed from from the world that we live in Mm. and so a lot of our research does have you know a lot of um direct um uses in in, out in in the world beyond the university and so Mm. that's which is also really good and something that we we value more and more that we can show Mm. that that that's happening and i guess you know this is one way that where we can reach that that different type of audience Mm. do you feel any pressure to build your brand i mean you know going back to sort of the precarious kind of aspects like do you feel that oh maybe i should be spending time or maybe like i would look better if i'd had this that and the other does that (laughs) i mean no but i've I've heard that it does it does affect people is that any do you feel any of that pressure at all um so there was there hmm, yes right there is pressure to show that you can deliver on all aspects of of the the job which Um, is going to be expected from the job but I mean for your personal uh you know like for your own career advancement I suppose or do you feel that you know like the work that you're doing will be recognized by the people that you work with and that's that you know that's still solid and sound and I don't need however many followers um I don't think that that would hold much sway with the people that were making those yeah. decisions um but but i guess you know there there is pressure to have an academic brand to be known for something mm-hmm. and particularly known internationally mm-hmm. for your expertise in a particular area so mm-hmm. you know it's it, that can't be it's not unhelpful <laughs> Well, and I think so. For example, I was just um, invited actually to a conference. I've turned down the conference. It's in Oregon, but um, you know that um, the reason that I was invited. I think the the person who invited me um, had seen some, some things on Twitter, and then you know started looking at what I was doing, and 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 so it's it's certainly not unhelpful. But I don't. I. I why did I join then? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I, I, because everyone I, else did. <laughs> right. And I thought for a while, you know, exactly. As I said, I'm a late adopter. So I saw everybody else doing it. And then mm. I kind of asked people, yeah, is, is this useful? And they're mm. like, oh, well, you know, you can, you can pick up on things that are happening that, that you might not have known about. So yeah, I mean, and it's so, it is really hard to keep up with. Mm. how quickly things advance and keep up with the literature and you know you you could spend so long reading what what everybody else is producing mm. um navigating through that can be kind of it can be kind of helpful to see on twitter the response that that's immediately happening and mm. and uh, so something that you might want to you know pay a little bit more attention to or something that's you know from a few years back that just gets thrown up and then someone sees it or someone saw it a few years ago and they finally got around to going oh I, I saw this <laughs> thing years ago and I finally come back to you and mm. read your paper and this that and the other and now I'm getting in touch yeah yeah so, I I mean it 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 provides opportunities like definitely but mm. it, it, it is something that you know it, you can fall into. So we've got two questions left. So right. <laughs> I'm going to do, I'll do the UBI question first. 
Um, so are you, are you aware of universal basic income? Are you, have you come across the idea before? Yeah. Um, I can't say that before you asked the question, I'd, I'd had a lot of thought, you know, I, I thought about it in terms of the wider society and I think that's you know, mm. it's probably a good idea in terms of, if you um, got it, <laughs> my, well, so part, part of what I worry about is that, um, as I mentioned to, to do this career, you have to train for a long time mm-hmm. and not get paid. You know, I didn't have, mm. um, uh, a, a paying job until mm. I was 26. Mm. Um, I had, I, and yet I was in a lucky position. I had, I didn't have to pay tuition fees. I, um, oh, I had some help from my family. Mm. Um, so, uh, and then I got, um, a, a funded PhD stipend, which wasn't, you know, it's not, it's not lots, yeah. but it, it was it's sufficient. Something. Yeah. Right. It didn't allow me to save anything. Uh, didn't start my pension, you know. <laughs> so, so there's a whole long time where, yeah, actually, it's financially very difficult, and I think that could be really off-putting mm. to people who um, don't have the support that I had. And in fact, you know, my if I had had to have taken out a student loan or and mm. other loans mm. you know um my mother as i said was not um somebody who really understood university and she's very risk averse when it comes to mm. to you know um finance and so i genuinely don't know if i would have been able to take this this route mm. and so i do worry that 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 means that this isn't a very socially accessible career mm-hmm. necessarily mm-hmm. and so yeah may, maybe um having you know some form of, of ubi would mean that more people felt that it was a reasonable route to take mm. um and of course also there are lots of people at the university who aren't academics mm-hmm. and so you know are not on an academic salary now mm. um <laughs> I don't know. You must be aware that we have had some industrial action mm-hmm. recently, and and this is one of the one of the aspects is is the pay um, mm. and how how fair that is, and the pensions mm. and the working conditions. And so, mm. yeah, may, maybe this would be <laughs> a good idea that actually does, as I said, not just affect the society that I live in, but mm-hmm. maybe would affect the the my my career. So yeah. I uh, just so many massive effects, but we're we're pressed for time, so I'm not going <laughs> to carry on with that. So uh, I mean, well, we're over time. Um, so uh, change question. So if you could change any three things about your work, um, what would they be? So this was this was hard to think about. Uh, not not question. because you know that there are obviously things that that could change for the better. And I thought mm. actually one of the I think the main thing that would make um, the lives of our students and our colleagues better would if we could change the funding model for universities. Mm. I don't I don't know if you're aware, but if you look at the OECD um, data, Mm. we are right at the bottom in Mm. terms of um, the ratio of public to private funding for universities. Mm. I think that puts a lot of pressure on our students Mm -hmm. it puts a lot of pressure on our um, academics it puts a lot of pressure on the university as a whole to be you know we are charities but we Mm. need to run as a business Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't be financially sustainable Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the way the funding model is set up at the moment it's like we're we're a we're a business that can't actually charge um, what we would need to for the mm-hmm. product that we make. Mm-hmm. And so some I, things have to run at a loss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am of the opinion, of course, I would say this. It's my job um, that university is a societal good, yep. not just for the people who go to university. It has impacts on the community that the university yep. is in. It has global global impact global public good Mm. and so i really feel like this should be funded differently Mm. and funded through a fair taxation system Mm. not through 
upfront student fees I mm-hmm. think that um that really changes the one who who thinks that they want to to sort of have that investment to go to university um I think it changes the dynamic between academic and student and mm-hmm. and almost a consumer rather than a kind of collaborator in this sort of learning journey mm-hmm. um it changes the future of the individual with all the debt as well because yeah, they don't absolutely whether however they think about it it's still going to impact their life it's yeah. still a significant thing in there yeah yeah before they've even taken on huge amount of debt to have a mortgage or whatever right if they can ever do that anyway <laughs> if if that's a thing in yeah. the future yeah. so uh, yeah i would if i had a magic wand i would change that and i think that would have so many knock-on benefits as well mm-hmm. in terms of my colleagues work-life balance and their mental health um in terms of um you know what what we're really able to do in terms of research and for our students i mean it's there's probably no perfect system Mm -hmm. but as i say you know you look across our our sort of um similar similar countries and we're right at that at the bottom of of that list we're we're below the us in terms of that ratio between public and private funding could could do better must try harder must try harder um and so uh, yeah i think that that would be transformational (laughs) for Mm. us and in a way you know i think we're doing really great things uh put like pushing a rock up a hill (laughs) and was <laughs> and we're still doing really great things so I, that's that... that's one have you got another two? Oh, okay you don't so... have to you don't have to <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you say that's the main thing I'm, I'm you know i'm happy that, with that but if you've got that two more you want to add is the main thing what yeah. one other aspect i i thought was academics um there are a lot of expectations on them in terms of what they are doing and Mm. the job is very varied and I think there are some aspects that are probably not things that we should ask academics to do so one of the things is um supporting the mental health of our students and this is becoming more and more concerning I mean there there are lots of issues and and of course why wouldn't there be given (laughs) this current state of things and, and what we've what we've been through we are not trained to to give that support. We have a service who are trained to to mm-hmm. do that, but but I think there's a real kind of muddy um, distinction as to who is giving that support. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that can come from all of us, from our managers, from the pressure that we put on ourselves, from our students and their parents, for example. Yeah. Um. I think that that is a I, I would really make that distinction much more clear. And I think that mm. would actually, it would alleviate the pressure on, on my colleagues. Mm. It would also give, um, it, it would make it clearer how the students get the proper, proper support. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that was, that was another one. And um, I would just um, make it, sure that nobody ever got a rejection again <laughs> no i would i wouldn't do that i think you know it's um is it healthy uh it, it's it's useful as i said earlier to have that it's external good to have eye. limitations as right. well yeah. right and, um, and push back and challenges and yeah and you know we have we have to live within within the world that we live in so i think mm. that's there aren't endless resources and so i think actually no that is something that Although it's is is horrible, is is something that is just the way way of things. But yeah, so that's um, I only really came up with two things, but one of them was really big and would have yeah. massive implications. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to just quickly pass over to you. Like, is there is there anything that you want to say to to kind of sum up, finish off, or anywhere you want to point the listeners to? I will put any socials that you've shared with me in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, over to you quickly to to say anything you want to say. I'm not sure there's anything more that I want I want to say. I, I really enjoyed having this opportunity to chat with you. I think um, it's, you know, we started off thinking about uh, what I wanted to be when I grew up and how I didn't know that this was an option. And actually, this is a really lovely opportunity to sort of talk to you about what I do. I think it's quite a, 
maybe a misunderstood sort of role because I think it can it can be a role that people think of as an extension of of a, a sort of school teacher yeah um and you know if, if you think about it along those lines it can be really um hard to understand what we're doing throughout you know all of those very long holidays when mm. we don't have any students <laughs> as well mm. I can assure you we are working really mm. hard <laughs> um and so actually yeah thank you for for this opportunity and I hope it's um well been useful to you and something no it's a pleasure I mean, we've, o- we've overrun I'm gonna have to stop speaking to scientists you're all too interesting <laughs> Thank you again to Amanda for being my guest and thanks to you for listening to the show. Thanks again to all my guests and everyone who has donated or helped the project in any other way. And of course, thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. OK, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Thank you again to Amanda for being my guest and thanks to you for listening to the show. Thanks again to all my guests and to everyone who has donated or helped the project in any Thanks again to all my guests and everyone who has donated or helped the project in any other way. And of course, thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. OK, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds and on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Western Studios Leeds will help you realise your podcast for only £25 for an hour of podcast work. Need podcast production, recording, editing or any podcast admin doing? Need it all doing? Do you want or need a podcast host or co-host for your podcast project? Then get in touch with Western Studios Leeds Limited. Email makemypodcast at western-studios.com to get your podcast made. I am available to third sector organisations, small to medium sized businesses and individuals who want to make podcasts or create other digital audio content. Want to make some fundraising case studies? Want to show off your expertise in your field? Want some help creating your show and format or just some support learning to podcast and getting going? Whatever your podcast needs, get in touch with Western Studios Leads. Go to western-studios.com and use the contact page to drop me a message about either working hours or about your own podcast project.